listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from Cinema Jaw Studios in Chicago. My name is Matt K, and with me is Rye the Movie Guy, and sitting to my left is Phil Me and Phil. Hello, hello, hello. This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we finally get to it. Bar- Barbenheimer. Barbenheimer. <laughs> Boy, what a thing. What a thing. It really blew up. I mean, we've been talking about it all month. Both yeah. Barbie and Oppenheimer coming out the same day, and we're finally here. The, the synergies between these two th- films, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. But it's a real thing. Jawheads, you probably heard us discuss this last week. At the time of the recording, they had only gave us one option to see both movies, and it was on the same day. The day after we recorded that podcast, they added a Barbie screening, and I was able to catch both. So I have seen both films. Our guest has seen Barbie. You have seen Oppenheimer. We got the Jawheads covered. We got them covered, Ryan. And who is our guest this week, Matt? Doug Walker, also known as the Nostalgia Critic, YouTuber, film critic, friend of the show, back again. I can't wait to talk to Doug. It's been a long time. It has been a while. I, I see him at screenings. He's always like in disguise a lot of times. He's got his hat down. No one talks to him. I know, Doug. I don't like to talk to people at screenings either, especially you. Yeah, I sat away from you during Oppenheimer. It was, it was, like, it was like a little vacation. <laughs> Besides that, Jawheads, we are going to do our top five nuclear movies in honor of Oppenheimer. This is post-nuclear. We left it kind of wide open. It could be nuclear threat, stuff about nuclear war, and, and the fallout from it. I just want to... <laughs> I just want to find out how many nuke puns we can get in there. Like, is this episode going to bomb? That kind of thing. Mm. Well, we're on our way. We're on our way. And we are still celebrating both Greta Gerwig and Christopher Nolan this month. So we're going to start it off with two facts. But before I forget, Matt, you will take on Doug Walker in Ryan Gosling, Margot Robbie movie trivia in honor of Barbie. Okay. Sound good? Sounds okay. Let's get this show rolling, Phil. Yes. So uh, let's start with Greta again for our facts. Greta, we've learned a lot about Greta Gerwig, I think, as a person, not just as the icon she is. Uh, But she's also a huge music stand while working on Lady Bird. She was on a mission to perfectly capture some of the angst that we all had in high school, especially people who were growing up in the the same time period as the titular character. Uh, And you will not believe how far she went to get that music. Uh, She went on... Full-on detective mode, totally invading these people's privacy, personally writing to the artists who appeared in the movies, um, sliding into the DMs, begging and pleading for them, uh, possibly even bribing a small bit. Uh, When it came to Justin Timberlake uh, and Crimea River, she poured her heart out saying, and this is a quote, I remember being in the cafeteria at lunch and someone played it for me on their disc man. I wanted to hear it again right away. As loud as possible. And guess what? Justin Timberlake, as smooth as the dude is, as nice as the dude is, could not resist her passion and gave her the green light, uh, which is great. Which I also think is fascinating because we don't always think of these people as having direct uh, licensing over mm-hmm. that. Uh, but that's incredible. Uh, and yeah, that that's how she got all of those songs. I, it was a passion project for her. You know, that was her baby, Lady Bird. Yeah, and probably the one that really broke her wide open, For right? sure. Yeah, Absolutely. So. And so it's it's great to hear those kind of stories that she cared about it so much to be reaching out to the artists herself to get the and rights that, to the music. And that Justin Timberlake actually responded. That's pretty neat. Right, yeah. right. Uh, well, honestly, how have we not been doing that for Cinema Drum? I, I've been asking Matt this for years. No, I talk to Justin Timberlake all the time. <laughs> oh, and we're not invited. No. I see I see. Uh, <laughs> this one, I I think we have never had a theme guest uh, relate to Rye the Movie Guy as much as we have Christopher Nolan, I think. Uh, and, and this is going to sound as a pejorative, but this is one of the things that we love about Ryan. Christopher Nolan is one of the biggest Luddites on the planet. Uh, you don't see the dude tweeting or on the Instagram because he doesn't have those. Uh, he's living on the past, shooting celluloid using old school film techniques. And he's not even a fan of smartphones. He is farther behind than Ryan in that because Ryan has a smartphone. Uh, he's got a, a tiny little flip phone for emergencies and that is it. Uh, it. When asked about it, he said nonchalantly, may I add, I am easily distractible, so I don't want the internet pulling me in every time I'm 
board, uh, which I think is great, but it makes me wonder, like, the dude has to poop super fast. I don't... <laughs> Maybe he reads, <laughs> Phil. Remember reading? Like, just have a comic book handy next to the toilet? Right. Gross. People used to have books on the on the top of the toilet. I still do. Gross. That's not all it. That's not even it, though. Doesn't even have an email address, oh. which I don't understand. So He's a Luddite. So what you're saying is if Greta Gerwig wanted to use a clip from a Christopher Nolan movie, she couldn't reach out to him directly. No DMs, no email. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nope. Unless she has his direct line, she can call his flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. I, I actually just heard an interview with Christopher Nolan, and he said the same thing. This just came up, like, yesterday when I, I was watching a clip of him. I was like, wow, he doesn't have a, a smartphone? And, and now we read the fact. Well, he's doing something right, obviously. So, that works for him. Yeah, obviously. You know... What works for, for people? The Nostalgia Critic. It sure does. Yeah. We had Doug Walker back on. Let's throw it in the fish tank. Get the episode number out. We'll have that fact. We've had him on once before. It's a pleasure to bring him back. Doug Walker, the Nostalgia Critic. Welcome back to Cinema Jaw. Great to be here. How have you been, Doug? Uh, not too bad, man. Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, still, still in a phenomenal city with phenomenal people like yourselves. So uh, doing pretty good. That's great. For, for people who may be living under a rock and are not aware of the Nostalgia Critic and, and everything that you do at Channel Awesome, can you no, give... No, please, most of my fans are under rocks, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's where I find most of my fans, but no. <laughs> can we give them the, 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 the elevator pitch, the view from uh, 10,000 feet or however you say it, in a nutshell? Oh, uh, of just the show and stuff yeah. like that? Uh, so, yeah, we've been doing it about... 16 years which is crazy to think wow. and uh you know it, it just sort of these youtube uh reviews and comedy sketches and stuff like that and the character that took off the biggest was uh called nostalgia Crick, where we talk about uh movies and shows that maybe people grew up with in uh the 80s and 90s and now you know early 2000s and stuff and also talk about recent films that have tie-ins to nostalgia which you know lucky me there's a lot of yeah no uh, shortage so yeah and we've been like I said, doing it about 16 years, and it started off as a character that kind of hated everything. That was kind of the shtick, and it was stuff that most people wouldn't get angry at, like, you know, the Care Bears movie or something like that. Uh, and then over time, people seemed to like sort of my real thoughts on stuff, too, so I, I blended it more into that. So now it is much more my thoughts on movies. There's just uh, a lot more comedy, and it's my thoughts kind of turned up to 11. You know what I mean? They're a lot more exaggerated, but it, it is my genuine thoughts now. And I've actually opened up to a lot more positive reviews. And I guess a lot of YouTubers like it because they say there's so many critics that are so negative <laughs> that they like seeing somebody actually be more positive uh, about movies and not just searching for stuff to get angry about, even though that was the original intent of the character was to kind of satirize, uh, you know, critics that do that. So how long does it take to make one of these uh, skits? Because uh, it's got some production value in it. So, do you guys write that throughout the week, uh, and then and then do multiple takes, or how long does one of these videos take to produce? Well, so we it is a production, but it's not an expensive production. So everything is kind of rushed, and it's supposed to have a little bit of a cheap look to it, certainly. But I kind of like that because I have seen. I I feel like when we started out, we wanted more of like a super polished look to it you know well we'll get there we'll get there but as time has gone by i feel like the more polished and nice looking something looks sometimes the less of a connection it can make to your audience especially if you're a youtuber i feel like especially now the big thing is being genuine so i still like finding new ways to do reviews do a review through whatever a character a song a story you know and sort of work in different types of commentary but uh i am definitely more aware now to keep it like a little bit more low budget i find people actually like sort of the more low budget stuff more when we try to do something big but it looks cheap kind of like uh monty python in that sense and uh they usually take it with actors and uh you know script writing and stuff like that and the editing uh it, they usually take roughly about two weeks uh to wow. do. interesting um all right here's here's a question doug uh i've seen a lot of your videos have you ever had a moment, I'm sure you have, can you tell us about a moment when you were in the middle of something and you're like, what the hell am I doing for a living? Like, what? you know, like, I, I, this is crazy. 
there's one moment. It's not as much me as my brother. My brother uh, Rob helps me uh, write the episodes, and you know he'll act in them and stuff like that. And uh, when we were watching the Cat in the Hat movie, it was the scene <laughs> where he gets hit in the nuts, and it cuts to him wearing a checkered dress, swinging on a swing, and it just cuts away. And after all the insanity of this movie, he just grabs me. We weren't filming or anything. He just grabs me and screams as loud as he can in my face. What are we doing? <laughs> and he just had a complete meltdown because the movie was that bad. And that was just the moment where he could not apply any sense to it whatsoever. <laughs> uh, and, and there's been a couple moments like that, but that was probably the one that was the funniest because now we usually film our first reactions uh, to movies, but that was the time we didn't even film it. He, that was that was just for us, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. So you guys got some passionate fans out there. I was wondering if there was uh, one particular review that they were the most outraged or the biggest reaction you got from, uh, you know, tearing a movie apart. Uh, it, it over the years it, it switches. The, the probably the biggest one in a while was um, I did a musical review of The Wall and I really wanted to experiment with it because I liked the movie and I liked the music and I kind of wanted to do something similar and abstract and sort of do like, well, yeah, like the old curmudgeon watching it now compared to like the young optimist watching it back then and compare the two. And I just thought, oh my God, this is so artsy, so experimental. Let's go, go over great. And people just hated it. Like there were videos talking about like how much they absolutely despised it uh but even the flip side of that is that now there's reviews of reviews and you want to be positive <laughs> of course no that's but, a niche really think, no no but really think about it. that's acknowledging that reviews are worth talking about are worth reviewing and i've always said uh reviews are like forms of art in my opinion i like the idea of using art to critique art so of course you want to be positive you want them to like your stuff but even if they don't and they're like here's why i don't like the way this is put together that's still saying there is a way this can be done right and can be enjoyed and talked about in a way whether it's positive or negative it is being talked about and being discussed and i don't think reviews were seen that way before it was just somebody uh going on or whatever writing going making a video and just saying your thoughts and that was in i feel like over time we've seen uh it, so many people really turn it into an art form and that is something where again you kind of wish you could find a better way uh you know of discovering that but at the same time it, it, yeah it, in many respects it is really cool to suddenly see your work talked about by other critics it's just a shame it's not positive <laughs> Well, you know, it. Well, maybe we can do like a, another layer of this inception. Speaking of Christopher Nolan, and mm -hmm. review the people who reviewed your review. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know? that uh, as well as a form of art. I mean, right. Come on, clearly, uh, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> this is Charlie Kaufman esque. Yeah, I, yeah, I right. like where this is headed. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. Good stuff. No, but but again, we've been doing this 16 years, and like I can probably count on one hand how many times we've had a review that has just completely bombed and people hated. So yeah, I definitely didn't want to sound like there's you that people didn't like. Like no, I am so grateful to have this job and have you know the opportunity I have to be doing it uh, for as long as I have. Yeah, no doubt, man. We're fans over here. Congrats on all the success. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. There were uh, several years back, you you uh, retired this nostalgia cr critic for like a, a short period of time. You you have no plans on retiring now, right, Doug? This thing's going strong <laughs> yeah, for years was, to come, yeah. right? <laughs> that was another mistake. <laughs> Trying to get rid of that was another one we got a lot of backlash on. Um, and uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get rid of them at some point. I mean, that as the as the opinions kind of merge together uh, of like the character and my own opinions and stuff. Uh, We'll retire him at some point. I mean, like, am I going to do this till I'm like 60, you know, or whatever? But uh, again, I think there is, you always got to play, as you well know, I mean, you've been doing this a while. Sure. Uh, yeah. too, you got to just sort of go with the flow and go with the changes uh, in this industry. And there's both something that's, you know, it's frustrating because you can't always plan too far ahead. But on the other hand, it's always kind of exciting, too, because you don't know what's going to come from it. Like, I feel like YouTubers now, you can look at something like Mr. Beast, which is amazing what he's doing, and be like, wow, that's phenomenal. But then you can just look at some dude literally just sitting at his desk talking. And that can get, you know, like a fair amount of views. Like, it, it seems to be that genuineness 
seems to be what people respond to right now. And that's something I hope in many respects still keeps going. Cause I, uh, it, that's one of the things I really think that is unique about like YouTube and the internet, as opposed to, you know, something like Hollywood, which, you know, is amazing, but there is sort of that disconnect between like, uh, you know, the actor, the writer, director, and the viewer, the audience member. Uh, so I'm hoping that is still around whenever I decide to retire or whatever, just keep, do something different, whatever. I, I hope that's still a large part of uh, YouTube and just internet culture in general. Here, here. Yeah, well said. So for the jawheads that are listening to this that might not have checked out the Nostalgia Critic maybe, or been over to Channel Awesome. Maybe they don't have smartphones. Right. Like, you know, they're new to this whole internet thing, like Christopher Nolan. Right. Where should we send them online, Doug? Uh, you can go to channelawesome.com, or you can just type in Nostalgia Critic on YouTube. Uh, you'll find us there, uh, too. So pretty easy to find. Awesome. And you do social media, Doug? Should we, we send them over to your Twitter? <sighs> Yeah, I do not, but Channel Awesome does. Uh, I'd have to look at the address here, though. <laughs> we'll throw it in. Don't, I, don't worry. We'll, okay, throw, we'll do the I research for you. I am rarely on Twitter. In fact, I'll, I'll even change it. I am never on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only time I've ever been on Twitter is somebody told me Roger Ebert liked a video I did. I framed that tweet, but I never go on outside of that. <laughs> Awesome. We'll put the, the Channel Awesome Twitter handle in the show notes for everybody. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Perfect. You got it. Uh, let's end this interview with a question about Greta Gerwig and Christopher Nolan. This question, it's a, it's a hot take here, Doug. We, we want that honesty that you're talking about. Going forward, it, for the rest of their careers, you could only see all the films from one of those two filmmakers, and you could never see any from the other filmmaker. Who would you pick to see? All the films of Greta Gerwig going forward or all the films of Christopher Nolan going forward? Well, that's rough because Nolan's that's got rough. a bigger library, so he has more opportunities to fail, where Gerwig's got, what, like five movies, something like that? Um, so she's definitely made more good, you know, percentage-wise, she's made more good movies, but, like, I, I don't know, Dark Knight's one of my favorite movies, uh, so I think just to watch that as long as that's in the library I, I think i gotta go with nola how about you man? are you saying going forward yeah what they have and going forward okay then i i have to say gerwig and here's here's why nolan is amazing a genius i agree with doug on on dark knight for sure but i think gerwig has more left to say whereas nolan he, i don't want to say he's peaked but he's approaching his peak there's not I, too yeah. many more films I, where... I think he's right in the the sweet spot right now. I, I agree. agree with that. I would still say Nolan with that <laughs> said, but I, I, I like fair. your thinking. I like your thinking on that. So. I'm going Gerwig. All right. Well, Doug Walker is sitting in on this entire jaw. He has his top five new queer films picked out, as do me and Matt. And we did that because me and Matt saw Oppenheimer. Yeah. Let me tell you about a movie by a Hollywood icon, someone nominated for Best Director and Best Screenplay twice. A personal passion project helmed by a husband and wife production company and backed by a major studio. In front of the lens, an all-star cast of talents, each bringing their A-game to embody characters that have left a profound mark on history. Their performances resonate with depth and authenticity, elevating the narrative to profound heights. This film is more than just Entertainment, Ryan, it's a testament to the power of storytelling and the influence of exceptional individuals who have shaped the course of humanity. And no, I'm not talking about Barbie. There are few names as exciting as Christopher Nolan when we're talking about films. Here we are at Cinema Jaw. We are unapologetically big fans, but with a critical eye, <clears throat> Dunkirk and <clears throat> Tenet, but nevertheless, we are always excited when the big CN drops a new bomb on the silver screen. Ever in his corner and rooting for a success, but a three-hour epic about the man behind the Manhattan Project and another World War II movie, another ensemble cast featuring everyone in Hollywood that was not in the, la the latest Wes Anderson movie, Ryan and I lowered our critic goggles to witness the explosion of Oppenheimer. We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. They have a 12-month head start. 18. How could you possibly know that? We've got one hope. All America's industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. 
secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's done. Let's go recruit some scientists. Though many years have passed since the father of the bomb conducted his infamous project, many of us know at least broad strokes of the story. Wisely, Nolan shifts his focus to the internal and gives us a glimpse into the emotional state and the thinking of a genius. The Synopsis, a, bio a biographical thriller film written and directed by Christopher Nolan based on the 2005 biography American Prometheus by Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. The film chronicles the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, a theoretical physicist who was pivotal in developing the first nuclear weapons and thereby ushering in the atomic age. We have Cillian Murphy in the title role with Emily Blunt portraying Oppenheimer's wife, Kitty. Matt Damon as the General Leslie Groves, Oppenheimer's military handler, and Robert Downey Jr. as his foil, uh, Admiral Strauss. And then we have a whole bunch more people. Why don't we start off, Ryan, talking about some special effects. Well, hold on before okay. we get there, because oh. I want to just give you my, my hot take oh, really here we quick. Go. No, because Rise hot take. This is filmmaking at its highest level. Nolan commands our attention from the first few frames of the film all the way until the end. And like you said, it's a three hour runtime. Impressive. The visuals he provides are beautiful and haunting. The score of the film comes at you with force and helps ramp up the tension on screen. This is a movie with a lot of people in suits talking. Think about that. Most of the movie are people in suits talking, and somehow it's thrilling and has an energy to it that blows most modern blockbusters away. He once again does actually mess with time, giving us two different timelines at once, and it's effective. The first two-thirds of the film grips us, leading up to the testing of the first atomic bomb, and the last third grips us by seeing the trial of how history will forever think of Oppenheimer. Simply put, Matt, I was blown away by this. Yeah. And that, that's no pun. I was blown away. Uh, yeah, man. You should just write the review when you're so passionate. You're I'm like, not, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something. I'm not. But behind the scenes, you, you wrote all that. And I thought, well, he didn't give me a chance to give my hot take on the movie. And, and then you wanted to go right oh, into these. Uh, you could always have the hot take, right? You wanted to go right into these bullet points, like you said, special effects. And I'll start there. Let's like, start there. Because right away, and I'm talking in the first two, three minutes of the movie, we're inside Oppenheimer's head. We, we see, visually. Yes, visually. We see what Oppenheimer is feeling, thinking about. How he gets his ideas. Yes. The visions he has. And, and they, they have to show this somehow, and they, they do it crazy with, I, I guess what you would, how would you best describe it? It's almost like- uh, Experimental. Yeah, like strings on, on the can, screen. Like sometimes a, it's water dancing. Sometimes it's, it's just a strings of light. We're, we're seeing how a genius thinks about physics. Um, and, and Nolan had to show that in some kind of visual way. Instead of telling us what Oppenheimer's inner thoughts are, he shows us. And it, it's, it's like clear as day. Like we, you can figure out what's going on on the screen. I'm not going to tell you it's beautiful. Some of it's ugly, but it's well done. It's ugly in a beautiful way, if that it, makes sense. Exactly. And accompanied with that score, I do think we get this, this feeling of what's going on pretty clearly. E even with what you're describing, which I think is a good way to say it experimental like images but we understand what Oppenheimer's kind of thinking about yeah I'm still trying to digest how I feel about the score because uh, this suffers from the tenant effect at least in the in the first act uh, and, and then I think it kind of balances toward the maybe it's his sound mixer like somebody who's worked for him for a long time and I'm not trying to call people out here maybe that's how Nolan wants it but I found it detracting for the first third of the movie the score Yes, it helps us in understand the intensity of his brain, but it, the dialogue is poorly mixed. And there you go. I have to. That's my first criticism. Um, well, I had no no criticisms with that. Uh, you have written down next to go into history stance. Yeah, I, I dig this. He does not take a firm stance. Like if if ever a film was truly neutral, this is a, a great adaptation of a biography of a very complicated figure in history. There's a lot of different ways to feel about Oppenheimer and, and what he has wrought upon this world. And I don't think the movie tells you how to think about it. it. It merely presents a story to us and leaves us to make our own decisions. It doesn't make him a hero. It doesn't make him a villain. It's just like, here's a human being who did something exceptional. Yeah, well, I, I think, too, I don't think that 
Nolan's uh, focus necessarily was on on making us lean one way or the other as far as the history goes of it. I think he's he like us is it realizes it's just fascinating to watch mankind so eagerly pursue a weapon that has the ability to also wipe us out. That I think is the main focus, and and you got this genius that could have went in all kinds of different directions, but was harnessed by the U.S. military to create this bomb. Seemed um, to take to it with zeal, and and went with it. Yeah, and and then we see that struggle of once it was created, is I think that the moment it hits Oppenheimer, what he just did, the world has changed forever. It it can never the genie can never go back in the bottle once he has created this. This yeah. weapon, he has to wrestle with that implication and, for and, the rest of his days. And and you can argue, as do we all, you can argue that Oppenheimer may have had should have had the time to think about the consequences going forward. But you could argue he did, and you could argue that he did. I, I think the movie tries to show us just how. Uh, I, I think he was worried about it, but he was also so focused on the job at hand, and that was getting the bomb before Hitler. Right. Um, because they were really rushing the Nazis at this point when they thought the the, um, yeah. the, the Germans were going to get the bomb first. And so he was just completely focused on, on the job at hand. And it wasn't until it was created that he realized. We're talking about the man Oppenheimer. We're, we're, let's talk about the movie Oppenheimer, because we're, you and me are never going to figure out the, the, the implications but of that. That's what I'm saying in the movie. That's what I drew from it. OK. That's what I drew from it. Yeah. For sure, for sure. I mean, obviously, you know, lots of different people feel lots of different ways about this, but I don't think the movie presents a clobbers you over the head with any kind of message like this is how we want you to feel. No, I agree. I agree. But... Which I thought was really good, and that's difficult to do. Yeah. Because you got to make your your hero, meaning your main character, sympathetic and likable to a certain extent, but then he is the hero and the villain at the same time. It's it's very interesting, very complex. A story only Christopher Nolan could have told. However, I would say that Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, character Strauss is a villain. Yeah, right. He's yeah. he's like the ultimate villain in the movie because then we do start to sympathize with That's Oppenheimer. True. Right. That's true. Because after the atomic bomb was was uh, detonated, and obviously they used two bombs on the Empire of Japan. Then we get to the point years later where now they're questioning Oppenheimer's motives, and then all of a sudden Strauss becomes the the bad guy. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to talk about the pacing of the film because we've seen Bo is Afraid earlier this year, and we talked about how intense it was throughout the whole film. Holy crap. Still, still recovering. Very much the same feeling I had with Oppenheimer for me. I actually felt sore. Anxious? sore my body after I got out because I think I was so clenched up and tense for three straight hours. At one point, right before the, the bomb was going off, hey, this is a three-hour movie. Almost nobody got up in the, in the screening that we saw, and this was a packed house. I didn't Every get seat up, was and my bladder taken. is the size of a, of a pea. Three hours, Jawheads, and I, I think I saw one person get up to go to the bathroom There was the a couple, time. yeah. Anyways... As the bomb was getting ready to go off, I was like leaning forward. I was so tense, and I happened to like look over, and there were multiple people like leaning forward. No one was sitting in the back of the against the chair. Three hours. The pacing of this movie is ranching it up. I mean, to ten from the start to the finish. It's wild. Yeah, there, there's a couple of slower beats, but nothing I would say was a sag or a lull. You know, it, and and I think we needed the the slower beats to kind of catch our breath because. For a movie about like a, a historical biopic, this is gripping. It's like it is a thriller. I'd call it. I'd call it a thriller. It is. I mean, a it's the race to get to the bomb, and then then we got another race with the other timeline of the trial of Oppenheimer. You know, it's wild. Should we talk about the cast real quick? Yeah. So we said Cillian Murphy. We go back and forth on this. I looked it up at one time. Cillian Murphy. Earlier today, I double checked and I saw an interview with him, and he called himself Killian Murphy. Killian Murphy. Okay. I, my apologies. Killian. So we go back and forth. It's here a bad Senate habit, show. yes, because he was popularly referred to as Cillian Murphy incorrectly. Right. Killian. Killian Murphy. I apologize. And Killian. I'll start with him. Oscar nomination for Killian Murphy. It's in the bag. It's in the bag. I, I very seldom say locks this early in the year, but there's locks for Killian Murphy for actor, 
and Robert Downey Jr. for supporting actor. I think he'll get a nomination out of this as well. The whole entire cast was phenomenal. There were so many people in there. I mean, Josh Hartnett is still alive, and and not only that, he's in this movie. I mean, we got a Hartnett sighting. Does does Emily Blunt get a nod for for her supporting role? I don't think so. No? I, it, if anything, I thought she was a little um, underused. She has one particular scene She's where got a couple where she really uses her power. But speaking of that, Rami Malek, Oscar winner, Rami Malek pops up, and he doesn't even have a speaking role. The first time we see him, he's, he does something goofy, and we see him, and we're like, whoa, I, I know everybody had to have this thought, like, what? Is Rami Malek just popping up in a cameo here? He does come around in the second half of the movie and has a critical point, but even still, a minor role for an Oscar winner, uh, it, you know, like him. Yeah, yeah, Every and, and Matt Damon, too. I mean, like, when I see Matt Damon, I have this problem, like, oh, there's Matt Damon, and I had it just for a quick moment, and then I lost Matt Damon and, and was engrossed with the character. Mm. And and they needed him, because he did breathe a little bit of uh, comedy, yeah. a little bit of humor. At, like, the first meeting, I wrote this down, I was taking notes, and I wrote down first meeting with Oppenheimer and Damon, much needed, because it, it was the first time I felt my muscles, as I was talking about being so tense, their first meeting was the first time we were able to laugh a couple beats and I could relax just for a second and Damon helped soothe that tension. So his character, much needed. I just hope he goes on Jimmy Kimmel to promote the movie. <laughs> they have this great feud. I don't right. know if, yeah, oh, I, it's, it's epic. Well well aware. Okay. So I did want to say how the movie left me. There, there are some films where um, it ends and, and you're just, I, for me, I was completely somber. Um, th- it's interesting. This idea that, uh, and we'll, I might as well get to my jaw-dropping moment at the same time, but the, the movie left me so somber, and, and that brings me to the, the moment that I wanted to highlight, which was the scene after we've seen the uh, Trinity bomb gadget, as they were calling it, the test, uh, go off in the New Mexico desert. Um, there was this chance, literally a chance that, you know, they even brought the... Uh, mathematics to Albert Einstein to double check it and nobody could prove that they didn't drop this bomb and actually blow up the entire world because of the chain reaction of the atoms these are the greatest minds that we have and they weren't a hundred percent sure that that wasn't going to happen it was a less than zero possibility wild to think about but after seeing that bomb go off or more greater than zero yeah go on and seeing all of the scientists cheering because obviously they're uh, happy that they were able to pull this off, this you know thing that they've been working on for for years to see it achieved. But at the same time, it's that um, moment that I thought was the saddest moment because it's also the implication of what comes next exactly. and, and how many will will perish yeah. at their hands. And and then that leads into the the time where Oppenheimer starts to get it into his head of just what what he's created and seeing these two bombs leave the base that eventually are going to go off to Japan. I mean, I had tears coming out of my eyes. It was, it was very, very powerful. Yeah. I mean, the, the movie left me in some kind of way. You compared it to Bo is Afraid. I will say that it did not take me quite as long to process as that movie did, nor was I feeling sore from being tense. I loved this movie. It definitely gave me a lot to chew on, and I researched and went down the Wikipedia rabbit hole on Oppenheimer and all the all his cronies on my way home, the Manhattan Project and all that. Yeah. So... How about a jaw-dropping moment from you? The entire third act. After the bomb explodes, I, I really thought that the movie was never going to... I'm like, all right, like, where is this going? Christopher Nolan, I should not have doubted you. He connects all the dots, all the little pieces and things that he planted in the first act. All start to pay off like bing, 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 and my dopamine system is just going crazy. I loved it. Loved it. Holy crap, is he good. That's what Christopher Nolan is best at, taking a narrative and... and f- Telling it in a way you don't expect. Yes. It's amazing. He always messes with time, you know? I mean, from um, the movie where that goes backwards. Um, Memento. Memento. Yeah. To, to Inception, to Dunkirk. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, that's, what, that's what my quote is about. So can I do my quote first? Go, go for it. All right. Uh, this movie ramps up toward a stunning third act where the, where the split atoms of this intricate timeline rejoin in a reverse chain reaction and implode your expectations. Nice. Better than mine. I went with one of the year's best. See it in a theater for best effect. Uh, it, it was definitely an experience in the theater. Oh, I agree. Is this in IMAX? It is. Okay. I, IMAX 70 millimeter. 
Go yeah. see it that way, Jawhead. There's only a few theaters in the United States where you can actually see 70 millimeter IMAX. There's none in Illinois to give you an idea. Wow. Wow. So. How many Jaws, Matt Kay? Four Moment Jaws. Of truth. Four, four Jaws? Four, jo- four Jaws. Four Jaws for Ryan the Movie Guy. Wow. By far, one of the year's best when we both go four Jaws. That last time we did it on was Bo is Afraid. There you go. So, strong. Jawheads is playing in theaters now. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or our email, feedback at CinemaJaw.com. Well, I know Doug Walker, he, we just ruined the movie for him. Now he's never going to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't have to, Doug. Uh, <laughs> no, in many respects, uh, you kind of ruined Barbie for me a little bit <laughs> in a weird way. Um, because, I don't know if we're transitioning or not, but kind of everything you said that Nolan did in that film is not done in Barbie, and I find that oh, fascinating. All right. Well, uh, we're, we're gonna... I guess we'll get to that when we get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in the review. Interesting. We are going to talk our top five new queer films. Uh, you got your five, Doug, because you're going to get us started. I don't know if this was a tough list for you to come up with. It it wasn't, it wasn't, because it's, it, it's a weird genre, it I definitely. guess you could say, but uh, at the same time when I was looking up, I was like, oh yeah, I guess that is a, a nuclear film, and this is too. Uh, the way I kind of rated them or at least when i think of the word nuclear uh i'm a very visual guy so that's always what i go to i think what what's the visual that comes to my head okay. when i think of nuclear so that's kind of where these are listed um i wasn't sure did you want me to give a an explanation yeah of so, part? do you want me to just go down so, the list yeah or? so give us your number five and then we'll go round robin and we'll do our fives and fours and so forth so what do you got sitting at number five Gotcha. And I did have backups in case anyone repeated these, because I think there are going to be some repeated. <laughs> Probably. So, I, I got a few myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number five. Let me know if any of you had this one. Uh, Godzilla. Good pick. Um, Not on my yeah. list. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it, it's one where when you just think of like, especially nuclear monster, nuclear. Well, what's the craziest possibility you can think of? with a nuclear bomb, with radiation, with all that stuff. I mean, like, Godzilla has to be the first image that comes into anybody's head. Uh, You know, just taking this lizard that gets, you know, gigantic. It's such a silly visual, but at the same time, it's such an everlasting visual. We're still making Godzilla movies. Yeah, Uh, and they're still pretty good. Yeah, in a strange way, even when they're bad, they're good. I agree. And and it's also one of those where... um, he always has so much personality. Again, even when the film is done bad, there's always this personality of Godzilla that leaps out at you. And that's always very impressive. Somehow that character, even if the movie is just the way, even the 98 one, uh, there's still some possibility, uh, not possibility, there's still personality that comes out of that. No well doubt. done. All right, swing to to my number five. And I'm going to go with, listen, I'm just going to be honest here. I don't know why I like this movie. It's a guilty pleasure. Everybody hates this movie. Superman 4, <laughs> The Quest for Peace. I had it as an honorable mention. I mean, we're talking nuclear warheads here, man. I remember watching this in my grandmother's living room when, I, I don't know, I was like six or seven when this movie came out, something around that, that age, and Superman gets all the nuclear weapons. Maybe this was years after it came out because it was on TV, and throws them into the sun. He takes the nukes puts him in the sun what comes out nuclear man lex luther's got him as his lackey and all bets are off john crier pops up in this uh ducky you may be more familiar with him as ducky from sweet uh the john hughes films which one was that was that uh pretty in pink right pretty in pink yeah um and, and who doesn't love it when john crier pops oh, of up of course in it, especially right? in a superman movie especially in a superman movie he uh, has the weirdest way of saying, oh, no, in that movie. I never forget. He does it a lot. He just goes, oh, no, <laughs> for whatever reason. And for whatever reason, it gets a laugh out of me every time. That's about the only part that got a laugh out of me. No doubt. Intentional no doubt. laugh. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's Guilty Pleasure, Superman 4, Quest for Peace. That's my number five. What do you got there, All right. Ryan? So my number five, I'm, I'm picking a, a, a film in a series that may come up again, and I'm not going to ruin... Um, somebody else's higher pick. But for my number five, I went with Terminator 3, The Rise of the Machines. And Interesting. And the reason I picked it was for the ending sequence in this movie. And, and I'm going to spoil it here. I doubt people are dying to go see Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. 
It, I don't it, even old. think Arnold Schwarzenegger has seen it, frankly. <laughs> but it, it actually got favorable reviews back in the day when it came out. And the ending, I thought, was so cool because there was always this idea that the mythos of the Terminator is that Skynet is going to nuke uh, the world and then the machines are going to rise. And so when we got to three, it was like, uh, the whole point is that they're trying to stop Skynet again. Now Skynet is active in this one. What are they going to do? And the end scene sees John Connor and none other than Claire Danes, who would join the cast in that movie, right. go to a bunker, which they think is to stop Skynet. And and no. we think they're going to stop Skynet. And they get into this bunker, and it's just an empty bomb bunker right. and it was that's a, where they're going to survive judgment day and it was a harrowing moment when they realized they looked at each other and they're like we're not here to stop skynet we're here to survive and it was like wow and they know they start to hear the tra- uh, radio transitions that like the world's been destroyed and they're down in this bunker in the middle of the desert that was pretty good i'm going to give you yeah some props and, and again when we're talking nuclear it we actually saw it go through you know what i mean we didn't is see there it on be, screen is there going to be another terminator on your list I, there could be. There, okay. One of the greatest nuclear war scenes is in a Terminator movie. That I, I yeah, tough to argue against that. So, um, but my, yes, my brother had uh, real quick. My brother had a great line about that ending because you're talking about the ending. He said that ending is too good for that movie. Yes. He said the rest that's, is just bad, slapstick, and it's so silly. But that ending is so good it pisses him off. That's in that Terminator yes. movie. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> yes. Doug, I, I swear to God, I remember walking out of the movie and saying, "Well, the ending scene just made that whole entire movie like a positive." Experience experience it was like eh, don't like it and then the ending was like wow a it took balls to go through with the the sequence Mm. and just loved it well written it's all about the last line of a poem or the last few notes of a song like if you can end something really well then everything that came before doesn't matter yeah that's why we always end the podcast really well you know yeah aces (laughs) for uh terminator 3 rise of the machine so if you haven't seen it jawheads just fast forward to the last like 25 minutes (laughs) just watch the end (laughs) just frost nixon it (laughs) yep (laughs) all right into our fours what do we got doug uh i really like this movie i don't know what people think of it uh blast from the past the brendan fraser leisha silverstone movie i have Uh, seen it but i don't remember it Refresh it's a me. really charming movie, even though the two leads are, are kind of playing to type, certainly, where Brendan Fraser, uh, as a little boy, is put in a bomb shelter. They think the bombs are going off. And so uh, uh, his parents, well, them played by Christopher Walken, they just go in the bomb shelter. They're all set oh, to yeah. go. And they stay something like uh, uh, 20 or 30 years down there. And... He finally says he wants to go, you know, to the surface, to the top. He, he's a big boy now. He's grown up. He's going to go up there. And it's just his uh, kind of naive optimism and just his joy of being on the surface again and interacting just with different people that aren't his folks. Uh, that I mean, you know this role that Brendan Fraser plays. He can play it in his sleep, and he plays it very well. Just the charming doofus. And it is very <laughs> well written. It's written in a way where I kind of recall there's jokes in there that again i kind of think well that's a joke you couldn't really get away with now but because it's this family that was put in a bunker and they're from a different time period you sense the sincerity to it you know again it it feels genuine it doesn't feel like they're trying to punch down or anything with it uh and again it's one of those really charming comedies i think also really sums up that fear of that time period what people thought could happen i'm not gonna pretend it's a super deep film or anything but at the same time i think it really did play off of both the comedic but also very real fear of that time period sure uh, yeah i love blast from the past i haven't seen it in jesus man when did it come out like the 90s right 90s yeah, yeah. throw it in the uh, fish uh, tank Phil, and, and see if it's streaming somewhere i might watch it after the podcast i've never seen it i i know the cover and i know the movie you guys it's are funny talking about it, but i've never seen it yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it's, it's very charming it's a very charming movie they're from like the they went in the bunker in the, uh, around the 50s right so they come out with that sensibility yeah, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> sounds interesting it is it is all right, uh, swings it around to my number four. I'm going with the trauma classic, uh, Lloyd Kaufman, who you've met, Ryan. Oh, yes. And didn't appreciate. Class. <laughs> Thank, of, thanks for pointing that out. I just, I will every time. <laughs> we walked by Lloyd right, Kaufman's we've booth. told the story. I'm going to tell it again. Uh, and, and I'm like, hey, there's Lloyd Kaufman. Ryan's like, who? <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me, dude. <laughs> This was not that long ago. Anyway, class of Newcomb High. Class of Newcomb High. (laughs) Uh, This movie is a trip. It's really 
tough to get th- through. It's another one that has like an ending that's way too good for the movie with with the bikers going through the school and like tearing everything up. Um, it's trauma. So so go in knowing that, and I think you'll have fun. There's some really fun, gross out humor, some um, gratuitous sexual content, and some really disgusting violence. And if you're into that sort of thing. You can't go wrong with Class of Nukem High. And it, again, f- plays on the fears, the suburban fears of the bomb and nuclear waste and, and that kind of thing, where what are the long-term ramifications of being near this stuff? Like people mutate and turn into monsters and there's a giant squirrel and stuff like that. It's bonkers. It's great. It's it's trauma. Nice. You got to watch a trauma movie, dude. Well, I saw <laughs> The you Suicide Squad. seen one? I don't think he's seen no, one. No, I did. I watched... Um, the, Toxic Avenger? Yeah. One of them on the show, I watched it. Now I can't think. All right, all right, well, yeah. that's, I that's definitely crazy. have seen one, for sure. <laughs> yeah. We did it here on the, on the podcast. Um, my number four is a, a cheat. It's a miniseries, Chernobyl, which just came out in yeah. 2019, and it plays out like a long movie. So it sort of counts. I think it's four or five parts. It's not like a, a, a series. It was like a four or five part miniseries on HBO documenting the 1986 uh, disaster in Chernobyl. And this is a nuclear power plant that had a leak and uh, basically killed and gave all these uh, residents around the area, uh, got very sick, and um, a lot of uh, fault put on the Russian government at the time because they didn't want to um, talk about the disaster because they didn't want to look weak and they had it under control when they clearly didn't have it under control. And I, I, I remember the first episode watching this after the uh, uh, leak happens. You, you got this sort of like almost like a nuclear winter. There, there was like, you know, um, like ash. S- ash and like snowflakes coming down. That's different from nuclear winter, but I get what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And um, the residents of this town are like almost like playing in it. And and it's so sad because they don't know. And they all got sick, right? Yeah, they yeah. don't know the extent of what's going on. They're like, "What's this?" You know, and they and they're out there just watching it, and there's like all this radiation that is just all over this entire area. And it, I mean, th- this series like literally scared the hell out of me. You know, it was just so terrifying how dangerous, you know, it, yeah, nuclear power can be can when be, something yeah. goes wrong. Um, I, I, I highly recommend checking it out. It was on HBO Max. Um, now retitled Max, but I believe it's still sitting there um, and a must watch. All right. Chernobyl. I'm, I'm going to watch it for sure. It was a good yeah, one. Yeah, I, I never saw it. Too. I heard nothing but like praise about it. everyone I saw it just went on on how amazing it was. Yeah, yeah. It, it's got uh, Jesse Buckley in there, Jared Harris, a large cast. Jesse um, Buckley, huh? Yeah. Wow. Definitely check that one out. Into our threes. Over to you, Doug. What do you got at oh, number yeah. three? <laughs> um,. It's another one, again, very visual guy. This is what pops in my head. Uh, Watchmen always pops oh, in my head. Good there's pick. literally a guy named uh, uh, Dr. Manhattan in it. And, you know, how can you not think of the Manhattan Project and everything? Um, once again, I just, the two images that come to my head when I think of that movie, I mean, granted, there's a lot of great imagery in it, but, uh, you know, I, I do think of him. I think of the blue guy. I think of, you know, sort of the, the Adam, uh, you know, branded on his head and stuff like that. And, uh, then even though I, I can't remember if it was nuclear or what it was, but the uh, the destruction at the end of the city, which granted is not the same thing as in the comic and doesn't look as good as the destruction in the comic. Uh, it is something that makes me immediately think of, man, this is what can come of, you know, a, a nuclear power and just, you know, the this is about you know superhumans as well but even that's kind of interesting is that you're taking human beings and just giving them more power than they already have and this is what can happen and this is also done to save humanity and all of that how can you not read into you know nuclear power and the creation of the atom bomb and everything when all of that is being discussed dude i love that movie and honestly this is this is a controversial stance but i'm going to stand behind it I prefer the movie's ending to the comic book's ending because dropping a giant alien fish on, on the city to kill everybody, yes, that unites humanity, but I, I don't think it's as realistic as, as Ozymandias just destroying a, a couple of cities and that, that uniting humanity. 
the only thing because i because a lot of people say well you can't do a giant squid yeah. in the movie i'm like we're well, doing a naked blue guy running around you technically could but it, it's strange because on the one hand i agree i i think like just a giant explosion giant bomb makes more sense the only thing i really miss is the visual and the kind of, actually seeing the bodies in the comic still stays with me that's just such horrifying imagery that i remember that you that you can't really do with a buy at least not the type of you know bomb that they have in the movie uh that was the only thing i miss i actually didn't mind you know getting rid of the squid but getting rid of that imagery i i feel like snyder could have found a way to still work that in somehow because it really was haunting i gotta rewatch it with that in mind man i love that movie any excuse mm. any excuse um all right speaking of plots to use nuclear bombs to unite the world or set off a war uh, or save humanity i'm subbing one out because at number three i actually had godzilla as well but i'm gonna mm. go with spies like us <laughs> i love this movie it is totally 80s it's chevy chase and and dan Aykroyd at their peak or maybe just past it you know they they had just peaked and they were starting to come down but they were amazing um stupid spy movie that they they get fast tracked into the CIA only to find out that they're patsies um kind of shuttling around the nuclear football and the whole plot was to send in a couple of idiots to get to kick off World War 3 so so the west could have uh, an excuse for aggressions against the Soviets doesn't matter the it's Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd and 80s sensibilities Lots of gratuitous nudity, dumb jokes. I think they get put in a centrifuge at one point. Brilliant. Love it. Well, my number three. We got another power duo of actors, but not a comedy. Okay. 1995's Crimson Tide. Oh, you son of a bitch. Yes. You stole my number two. Yes. <laughs> Denzel Washington, Gene Hackman go toe-to-toe -to -toe in Crimson Tide. Uh, this came out in 1980, uh, 1995, and... Um, it was directed by Tony Scott, and it is about uh, a submarine who is getting uh, mixed messages on if uh, Russia, who Russia is in turmoil, and they they get a message that basically Russia, I think they had like a coup or someone took over, and yeah. they were going to use nuclear weapons against Japan and the United States. And Gene Hackman at this point wants to fire nuclear weapons at Russia. And we, we don't have... It's tense. Yeah, oh, it's huge, very tense. And it's it's great because these are, are two titans, right? I mean, these are great actors. Two of the best of all time. Yeah, Denzel going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hackman. And it's like, who's going to have power of the submarine? Who's going to ultimately win uh, this discussion? And is uh, the truth going to prevail? And it's like Hackman's pushing to get these uh, nuclear weapons fired. And uh, it, it, it plays out fantastic. It's, it's a thriller. Two things. I'll talk about this this movie. It was my number two, and I'll just knock it off the list here. Uh, there's two different ways to think about it. As the as the two actors chewing up the scenery, um, it, you you can they they're both so good at believing what they're saying to the other actor that that you can see good points for both points of view, even though we're talking about the destruction of the world. And the other point, like from a meta point of view you realize the scary thing about this movie is just how close we could have been at any right. moment. Yeah. There, were, there were individual uh, captains, I guess. I don't know what rank Hackman's character is in the Navy or whatever, but heads of the, the, the submarines that had nuclear missiles. Right. You know? It, like, they could fire them without mm -hmm. anybody else involved. Right. If they wanted to fire them, they could have fired them. They could have fired I mean, I actually don't know exactly how that works, that but theoretically. Could, could still happen today. Yeah, it's, it's, it is scary. It's harrowing. Yeah, and I, I did a, a little search on Wikipedia. It is based on some truth of something that really happened. Yeah, there, there was this this confrontation before, and then the you know it fictionalized from there. But it is based on some truth that there was a captain getting ready to fire nuclear weapons because he would gotten the wrong messages. Scary. Wow, love it. All right, into our twos. Into our twos, yeah. Doug. What do you got it to? Uh, this is a film that there's not a ton of people that have seen it. The ones that do either love it or hate it. And I kind of love it for that. Uh, it's called when the wind blows. Uh, this is actually an animated film. Uh, but it's not, not as cartoony as one would think. It's definitely not for kids. Uh, 
it is literally just this couple, you know, sort of this middle age, you know, kind of leaning towards old couple. Uh, it, it just kind of talking about, you know, you know, when the bombs might drop and stuff like that. I, I forget if they're very specific about when the time period is. It might have been around like, you know, uh, the 60s or so. But um, I think they wanted to keep it vague. And it does happen. The bomb halfway through the movie drops. And it's all about them trying to survive the after effects Yikes. of that. And just them putting complete trust in the people that got them there to begin with. And they're just the sweetest little couple. You know, I, I mean, just the kindest voice. And all they do is sort of go back and forth in the house. I don't even think you leave the house. I think you just stay in the house the whole time as they go back and forth having conversations about, you know, just something's important, something's not. And then after the bomb falls, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're just doing it to survive. Mm. You know, they're kind of getting the same arguments and stuff, but, you know, they still very much care for each other. And it's one of those movies where it's just showing very much the humanity of the after effect by taking this couple, uh, you know, and this predicament that, that hasn't really happened and I, I think it's in uh britain is where it takes place it's a british couple and you know it, it hasn't really happened it's a you know fictional scenario that's cool man i saw this one pop up in my research i've never seen it I, i've never seen it either so i'm glad it doug saw it and brought it up because uh, i want to see it now yeah the wind uh, but, but it is a film there are a lot of people that don't like it because it literally is just watching this old couple throughout the entire movie you don't see any other characters uh you know it could practically be a play Honestly, I feel I feel challenged. Now I really yeah. want to watch it. Your your number two was uh, Crimson. it was Crimson Tide, yeah, right. which I feel like we covered. <laughs> sure. Uh, so that lo leads us into my number two. Yeah, and I went with the movie. I know I've talked about it at least once before on Cinema Jaw called Thirteen Days, and it came mm. out in the year two thousand, and it is about the thirteen days during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, and Kevin Costner plays uh, like. Uh, an advisor to the president. Uh, this is, you know, the Nixon, uh, Nixon's, the Kennedys are in the, in the White House, and the Cuban Missile Crisis goes down. And basically, it is just a detailed event of all the information they had and the decisions they had to make. Could they bluff? Shouldn't they bluff? So on how and so forth. How close we got to the end. And exactly how close we came to hitting that button. And damn, it is terrifying that it came that close. Um, and yeah. we're, we're, people are just going back and forth, and you you don't know what to believe sometimes. You're getting information and intel that's saying one thing, and you got to go on that, but you also got to maybe bluff and show something that's going to get them to sort of stand down and take their thumb off the trigger. And uh, it's harrowing uh, work that went down during those 13 days. I, I had read about it, but uh, I think this is a great account of it. It's called 13 Days. Check it out if you haven't seen it, Jawheads. Kevin, Kevin Costner, any good in it? He's solid. Yeah. Okay. This was definitely top tier Costner. He's hit or miss for me. Yeah. Have you seen this me one? Me too. Yeah. Have you seen uh, this one, Doug? No. Um, I think Costner scared me away. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's at fair. At the time, I, re I really did not enjoy his diet. I think he's been pretty good lately, though. And maybe, the, the, for all I know, this could be around the time when he started to kind of mm -hmm. uh, change. Yeah, he, he just didn't emote enough. I mean, he never sounded interested in anything he was saying, but but it's changing now. I think he's pretty good now. He's had a, a lot of good movies. Yeah, he's kind of on a comeback right now. He is. Yeah. All right, so here it is, our moment of truth, our number one movies, Nuclear. What do we got, Doug? Uh, I feel like somebody else has to have this. I think we might one. all have it at number one. Yeah, I we might so. all. Let's see. Uh, mine is uh, Dr. Strangelove. Mine is Dr. Strangelove. Mine is not okay. Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> okay. At least me and Doug I know agree. what yours is. But before you say yours, I want to guess if I can Okay, see totally. It. We'll I play that game. But, um, uh, no, I mean, when you, again, just when you think of visuals, when you think of, you know, just the ridiculous reasons the world can blow up and everything. How can you not think of Dr. Strangelove? Just one guy goes goofy, works everything against ourselves to blow us all up just because he's sick of humanity. He's just gone nuts and he's in a high position of power. And there's just so many people who are leading the world and they're incompetent. And when they have to really know what's going on, they don't know what's going on. <laughs> and it's comedic how much they don't know what's going on. And it's 
funny as hell. It's got the amazing imagery, of course, of the bomb going down and him riding it like a cowboy. Because again, yeah. to him, he's doing, you know, his job. He's, he's saving the world. He's doing, you know, what's finally been called upon to do. It's the cowboy, you know, saving the day. He has no idea that just a complete nut is sending him out. <laughs> to do it you know and i don't know in so many respects how can you not look at that image of the cowboy on the bomb and just think america yes <laughs> you know i mean not even that like he's scared or afraid he's cheering on the way down uh that, that's just like one of the ultimate images i think of when i think of uh you know just it, the word nuclear and america i i'm yep. right i'm right there with you uh peter sellers three roles in the movie hysterical um i got this from wikipedia it says here the film is often considered one of the best comedies ever made and one of the greatest films of all time in 1998 the american film institute ranked it 26th in its list of the best American movies. Just missed that top 25. But, I mean, (laughs) very high on the list. And it has so many great lines and memorable scenes. Here's just one of them. It's it's one of my favorite lines. Um, This is when a fight breaks out in in the the war room. Uh, Listen to this, Jawheads. Try B-86543 Moscow. Yes, sir. You would never have found him through his office, Mr. President. Our premier is a man of the people, but he is also a man, if you follow my meaning. <laughs> what did you say? I said Premier Kissov is a degenerate atheist. Mr. Mr. President, I formally request that we have the signal. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Mr. President, Mr. President. I think they're trying the number. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Yes. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Absolutely classic. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick, thank you. Um, Dr. Strangelove, definitely in, in, in top tier movies of all time. I would, love you, it. would you put it in your top 10? Maybe not top 10. But okay. Like top 10. Top 50 for sure. Top 50. Yeah. All right. I mean, that is a worthy pick, gentlemen. No arguments here. Definitely. Can I guess what yours is? Yes, please. Is it some of all fears? It is not. Oh, thank the okay, Lord. Okay, okay. That was my guy. Okay. I'm surprised my office had that. Okay, yeah. Okay. Actually, it, it wasn't even an honorable for me, but that definitely fits the bill. I went with the first time. First of all, this was a large oversight on a recent episode, which, right. which had me thinking about it. Second of all, this is the first time I, as a kid, really understood what nuclear war would mean for humanity. I'm going with the Matthew Broderick um, gem of a movie, War Games, from 1980. Right, I can see that. 1983 or four. Can we throw that in the jaw box? I didn't write down the year, but I'm pretty sure it's right in there. Um, yeah. He he convinces an, an AI to play global thermonuclear war with him, only the AI doesn't think it's a game, hacks into the Whopper, which is the the military's computer that tracks Soviet submarines and missile launches, and all hell breaks loose. Thank God Matthew Broderick can find Professor Falcon, who wrote this AI, and get him to the underground bunker underneath the Pentagon just in the nick of time as the doors, the blast shields are closing, and play um, tic-tac-toe with the AI to teach it. That global thermonuclear war is a game it cannot win. I, I'm right with you. I saw this as a kid. This was one of those famous movies we had on the old VHS, and we would watch it all the time. And it, we loved the movie because we thought Matthew Broderick was so damn cool. Remember, he was. He, he was the first hacker. Yeah, he, he changed grades, you know. He had Alice yeah. Sheedy all, all over him, you know. I was like, wow, this guy really knows but what But she he's wanted doing. him to change it back. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was an honest girl. I like know? it, yeah. But, um... But at the same time, you're right. It was the first movie that I was absolutely scared of when it came to nuclear war because I was like, oh, my God, you're telling me the whole world would end right. if this happened. And it, it, it would scare me. I That's, was just a little kid. Doug, you were talking about the visuals. This is the movie where I finally, oh, I get it, because they show, this was like early computer graphic days, they show a simulation of these arcing lines coming from, from Russia and landing in New York, and it would just be a boom, a circle of light, and then Chicago, boom, a circle of light, and everybody's gone. That's Those circle of light is humanity getting wiped out and then our missiles hit in in the soviet union and all their cities are wiped out and soon it's everybody launching and all the cities are gone and i was well, like and, oh 
Uh, well, I was going to say, uh, even though it was released in the 80s, and again, it's seen as like kind of a, a goofy comedy and stuff like that. Not only, yes, does it point to how, you know, again, like a lot of these movies do, just how almost sloppily and inevitably nuclear, you know, bombs can go off and war can happen and so forth. Um, honorable mentions before we go to break. Yeah. So I mentioned Terminator 3. Yeah. But I was going to say for the simple scene in Terminator 2, of Linda Hamilton's Her dream, dream yes. where I, I still think it's it's one of the scariest depictions of nuclear war that that was in like a mainstream movie like this. It was, I mean, that dream yeah. sequence where Los Angeles gets hit by a nuclear bomb and, and the kids literally fall into ashes. She gets blown into a skeleton, if you'll remember, and the skeleton's still holding onto that chain link fence. Oh, yeah. Oh, it terrified the hell out of me. Seared into my brain indelibly. Yes. Great. Yeah, and there's, there's so many practical effects, too. Yeah, uh, in that there's definitely CG in it, but man, the the you're right. They, you know, when she said the kids blow away like leaves, that's exactly what that image looks like. Yep, yep. Ah, terrifying. So, uh, Terminator Two was an honorable mention. You mentioned uh, War Games. We, the day after, which was a TV movie, I never saw Blind Spot for me, but um, same, never saw it. So, it's supposed yeah. to be really scary. One that is a, a post-apocalyptic nuclear war movie, The Road. With Viggo Mortensen. Oh yeah. I had read the book. I think I've, I'm always liked it because I, I I enjoyed the book so much by uh, Cormac McCarthy, and uh, just that that idea of like a father and son literally just roaming the earth looking for food of what's left after a, a nuclear war is just terrifying in its own right. It is. It is. Boy, we need to pick me up after all this. How about we talk about Barbie soon? <laughs> yes. Woo! Let's take a break, and when we come back, me and Doug are reviewing Barbie. Yeah, see how that works? This yes. is the perfect double feature. I agree. Perfect, perfect. Oh, pick me up. That, if you did uh, Barbenheimer, you had to do Oppenheimer first. And I agree. end it with Barbie, so it's a, a pick me up for sure. Uh, we'll talk Barbie, and we're going to play some movie trivia. Stick with us, Jawheads. Let's, let's, let's all go to the lobby. Retrograde amnesia, Jawheads. What is that? I don't know. I forgot. But Guy Pierce sure didn't when he explains it in Christopher Nolan's Memento. Hi. Hi. I'm Mr. Shelby from 304. All right, what can I do for you, Leonard? Um, Bert. Bert. I'm not sure. I think I may have asked you to hold my calls. You don't know? Well, I think I may have. I'm not too good on the phone. Right, you said you like to look people in the eye when you talk to them. Yeah, yeah. You don't remember saying that. Well, that's the thing. I have this condition. A, a condition? It's my memory. Amnesia? No, 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 no. It's different from that. I have no short-term memory. I know who I am. I know all about myself. I just... Since my injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. If we talk for too long, I'll forget how we started. And next time I see you, I'm not going to remember this conversation. <laughs> I don't even know if I've met you before. <laughs> So if I seem a little strange or rude or something, uh, I've told you this before, haven't I? Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to mess with you, but it's so weird. You don't remember me at all. No. We've talked a bunch of times. I'm sure we have, yeah. Well, what's the last thing you remember? My wife. What's it like? It's like waking. It's like you just woke up. That must suck. That's all backwards, I mean. Like, maybe you get an idea about what you want to do next, but you don't remember what you just did. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Doug Walker, the nostalgia critic. We are about to review Barbie together, but before we do so, we threw at least two questions into the fish tank. Let's open it up. Wait a moment! It's fish! Isn't it? DC! Wake up! Wake up! It's an pad, it's a giant glass bowl! Hey, get some fish, folks! Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a certain message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. Thank you so much. Ryan, I'm going to one-up you. We actually had three questions, three questions in here this in the week. Fish tank. Uh, our first one, when was the last time Doug was on? Uh, how old is everybody feeling mm. today? Because mm. I'm not going to help any of okay. that. I, I remember Doug was 
all the way back when we were doing it in the conference room at in my um, office. In I office. recall. So this was before we were at Cards Against Humanity. So this was before the Ryan's house era, and even. this was before we were recording at my house. So even before that, I'll say Doug was on around. Oh my goodness! I'm going to say 2014. 14 was my guess too. Oh, am I guessing too? Sure, go ahead. Go yeah, for why, it. why wouldn't we let the guest guess? Uh, uh, um, 2013. I also don't know. All right, one dollar, <laughs> Bob. All right. I should not have prefaced with everyone feeling old. Uh, you guys may actually feel young. It was 2016. Uh, okay. 2016, oh, okay. uh, August of 2016, uh, episode 290, Best Entrepreneur Movies. We reviewed Sausage Party. <laughs> wow. Great movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that movie. I did too. <laughs> it's still good. Wow. All the way back then. Awesome. Yeah. This is also apropos because we're talking about Blast from the Past in the next question. Uh, when did that come out and if it was streaming, if I could find that. Uh, the movie itself came out in 1999, so just barely in the 90s. Okay. But where we were, it okay. was a firm 90s. Because it wasn't the question whether it was 90s or 80s, if I recall? 90s no. or 2000s. No, I think it was uh, oh, okay. mid or late 90s, yeah. I think. Yeah. I see. Yeah, 99, so... Well into the 90s. Yep. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not streaming anywhere, not even on Hoopla, no Paramount Plus, no Hulu. Uh, it is available to rent on all of the usual suspects, but who likes paying when we're already paying for that subscription? <laughs> it, it's worth it. I'll say it's worth it. I thought it was a very funny movie. I wind up paying for a lot of rentals, Terrible. but it always, yeah, always so pays. <laughs> yeah. It burns well, me. It burns me, too. I, I tried to go this whole year without doing it because I, it, it, we're paying how many you right. know, dollars every single month for these services? The, Put it on the services. The only way I justify it is is because we're critics and we get to go to a lot of screenings. True. So, true. Be honest. It's a tax write-off. <clears throat> yeah, you could do that, too. Uh, and then the last one we had, when did War Games come out? Matt, when did you say? I said 83. Nailed it. Doug, look out come trivia time because Matt's on his game tonight. It was 1983. Um, and while I was at it, I did look. There is like one shining ray of light in this episode's trivia uh, fish tank section. And that it, this is, War Games is streaming on Paramount+. Plus, So Ooh. at least we don't have nothing. Mm. We been don't years have a lot, since but I've we don't it. have nothing. I love that movie. It's been a long time. Yes. Yeah, I, I gotta see it again too. It's been really, really a long time. Was that everything, Phil? That's all we got. All right. Next week on the show, we are planning a review of Rama. As of right now, we're, we're planning right now to review Haunted Mansion, mm -hmm. Beanie Bubble, and Talk to Me, the new A twenty four horror film. Woo. Exciting. So three reviews. If you can see any of those jawheads, that what we'll be talking about next week. Let's talk about terrifying Barbie. movies, especially Beanie Bubble. Yeah, <laughs> all going to be very scary. <laughs> yeah. All right, Phil, jump back in that fish tank. You bet. Greta Gerwig, actress turned director extraordinaire. Her first two directed films, Lady Bird and Little Women, were well received. Both films were nominated for Best Picture Oscar. So when it was announced that her third directed feature film would be Barbie, a film about the famous doll. We all knew this was not going to be your typical toy movie. Gerwig co-wrote the script with her partner, Noah Baumbach, and casted Margot Robbie as Barbie and Ryan Gosling as Ken. From that point on, the hype machine was going. I put on my pink blazer and my white headband and walked into the theater only to find out I fit right in. Everybody was wearing pink. This is a full-blown Barbie celebration. Hey, Barbie. Can I come to your house tonight? Sure. I don't have anything big planned, just a giant blowout party with all the Barbies and plant choreography and a bespoke song. You should stop by. So cool. You can find me under the lights, diamonds under my eyes. This is the best day ever. It is the best day ever. So is yesterday, and so is tomorrow, and every day from now until forever. Yeah. You guys ever think about dying? <laughs> After a fun parody of 2001 A Space Odyssey, we open up in Barbie Land, a place populated with multiple Barbies, multiple Kens, and Alan. Alan is played by Michael Cera. Barbie's perfect life comes crashing down on her when she wakes up one morning <gasps> with flat feet. 
After seeking out advice from Weird Barbie, played by Kate McKinnon, she learns she must travel to the real world to find the girl who is playing with her and help her cheer up. Once Barbie and Ken see what the real world looks like, things will never be the same. I found Barbie to be weird in the best way. Barbie is hilarious at times. Barbie is smart. Barbie looks great on screen. I now know why the doll is so damn popular. We see a scene in the film where Mattel execs try to put Barbie in a box and it proves a difficult task. That goes the same for putting Barbie in a figurative box when trying to describe this movie. It's a parody, yes, but it also is much more. Doug, what do you think of Greta Gerwig's take on Barbie? You know, it's a mixed bag because I don't want to give the impression there that people shouldn't necessarily go see this or won't have a good time or really have a lot of connections with it. But everything you were saying about Oppenheimer, about how much they don't have to say and how much is gotten across just with the visuals and they don't have to spell it out, is the opposite of what Barbie does. Barbie, I feel like, is trying to do way too much and they're trying to explain everything while they're doing it. And... I think if this film was more simple, like the story you just said there about uh, Barbie going to find this girl to figure out why her sadness is connected to her sadness, that would be fantastic. And I agree a lot with what you said. But on top of the Will Ferrell backstory, there's also a story about Ken trying to find an identity, which is funny, but it also goes on for man, like at least a third of the movie when I felt like it should have been a lot less. The characters that she's interacting with don't get nearly enough screen time, even though it's supposed to be about them. It's supposed to be about, you know, their identity connected to Barbie. And on that note, I don't think Barbie has enough of an identity to withstand a two hour movie. But with that said, I agree with you. When it is weird, it is so fun weird and is creatively weird. The sets, uh, a lot of the dialogue is very, very funny. And I think fans of the toy are gonna see so much of the history in there as well. I wish it got a little simpler and had a little bit more focus. Uh, So I don't think it works as a whole but I do think there is going to be a lot of people out there that do connect with it. Yeah, I, I, I think we probably like the weird stuff uh, the most. It, it Definitely, that was mine, and I can hear it in your voice that you liked it. Um, Gerwig gives us some like weird flourishes, right? There's like this animation, for instance, like when they're driving out of Barbie land and the uh, car would flip over. Um, that it, it's just a bizarre visual. Maybe it would fit in almost like a Wes Anderson when he gives us that strange animation in some of his movies. Um, well, it's the and to me, that thing works, I can put it to. It, it works because it's very much like how a kid would flip over a car. The same thing like when they kick their shoes off. They don't just fly to the ground. They sort of go up a little bit and then float down the exact same way a kid would act like somebody's kicking off their shoes. Everything in that world moves that way. You know, when she glides down to the car you know a kid can't always fit whatever barbie in the little stairs in the back so you just have her sort of slowly leap down into the car and they all move that way like that's the kind of it's both weird and really smart at the same time that's kind of what i wanted more of yes i i think the the weird stuff is all in the barbie land i mean the idea um obviously people who have played with dolls of any sort know that there's no like liquid with anything right so all our coffee mm. cups and everything are empty if you put her in the shower there's no actual water coming out well yeah i mean if you had the little one with the pump you you could make the water squirt out, man. But in Barbie My Land... My sister had that one. <laughs> but in Barbie Land, there's no liquid water, and that's played for laughs here. Um, and, and much the way... There, there was only one image that I thought where uh, Margot Robbie was falls down on the ground where she acts like the doll, um, and, and she sort of is in that position of like how you would leave a Barbie doll laying on its... Um, you know, with the legs in the wrong way, and she's on the ground. It just looks funny, like a upside down doll and she rolls over um but all of that i think was the strongest point because it was just so bizarre mm-hmm. yeah i i'm wondering did you get sort of the same feeling i did when they go into the real world and i feel like if the characters just are sort of played out more naturally i make more a connection and the, and the message would be stronger but there's so many moments where they have to just stop and explain the message over and over and explain the commentary explain the satire and i felt like it was 
just be so much stronger. And it was stronger when they were just acting it out, when they were in Barbie land and even the few interactions they had in the real world. And whenever they had to stop and make a speech, I thought just the whole film came to a halt and it didn't need it. Both the director and the movie is smarter than that, I felt like. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, there's definitely, you know, especially America Ferreira, who plays the mom of this daughter um, that Barbie goes to see. She has that moment where she gives the a, a big speech in there and it, it does feel very forced. Uh, I don't think it, it interrupted my uh, enjoyment of the movie as it sounds like it did as much it did to you, Doug. But um, I know what you're talking about. There are definite moments where it feels like, OK, here's another speech. This is what the characters are feeling. Um, there is that that vibe in the in the film for sure. Can I ask a question here, guys? Uh, sure. Does uh, does this just become like Crocodile Dundee 2? Like in, in in the second half, well, like I've never seen that film. So Are you yeah, kidding yeah, me? Yeah, that is the crocodiles go back and take over Australia. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's Criterion Collection, Ryan. I mean, come on. No, what what I was going to say. Criterion Collection. <laughs> so you know what, what's weird is okay if you think of the movie Elf, where um, yeah, it's a fish out of water tale, right? Right. But what I would say is is strange about this one, and I don't know if you felt this also, Doug, is the real world was also represented kind of weird. We never really get uh, the, the vibe of the real world, right? I mean, I, I, I was okay with that. And I kind of remind me of Third Rock from the Sun, where I like it isn't just the aliens are weird. It's like the real world's a little odd. Right. Too. And I, I, I'll admit, I didn't get into Will Ferrell much in that I feel like he's really got up his humor. Honestly, I, I feel like that humor is very 20 years old, which he can still play with that a little bit, but he has to add something new. I just felt like this is stuff, you know, we've seen like 20 years ago uh, with it. So I could have used a little bit more, but, but yes, I like there's a division that's part of keeping the Barbies in Barbie land. <laughs> you know, like this has just always existed and they called each other like, uh oh, one of the Barbies got out. Oh man, this can be bad. And it's just so funny knowing like this part apparently is in reality in this world. <laughs> It is. And then it's Will Ferrell that's, you know, more well, or less he's, got the, the finger on the, the nuclear bomb on this one. He's got also a connection with the, the other big famous toy movie, the Lego movie. So is is that uh, was that comparison done on purpose, you think? Uh, I don't think so. No, OK, I don't. Um, but there's a lot of uh, reoccurring gags throughout the film. Uh, one of them is horses. So Ryan Gosling, once he travels to the real world, realizes that horses are cool. Right. Um, Ken's uh, arc here is because in Barbie land, Ken is just an accessory to Barbie. He was there just to be her boyfriend. He doesn't realize that men have a role in the world. And when he sees that they have a role, one of the things that he latches on to is horses. And I love that kind of stuff. It, it was everywhere when you went back into Barbie land. Uh, in the back, there were a, a projection of horses playing on the screen. There were horses everywhere. I thought that kind of stuff was hysterical. How about you, Doug? Well, and, and I like the line. It, it's not that at, at first I thought, you know, the, the horse was like a machine or robot, but then I found out it's an extension of the man. Like, you know, like there's some lines like that where I'm like, that's pretty funny. And yeah. there's some good jokes. Um, but again, I, I thought that subplot went on way too long, in my opinion, uh, where again, I had to remind myself the focus of them, but both Barbie and the mother and daughter were even in the movie. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a problem if I'm forgetting they're even in the film, if your title character is in the film. Sure. So lastly, let's talk about the uh, social commentary here on Barbie. Gerwig obviously making a, a feminist story, but I think she gives Ken and um, both genders sort of a fair shake. I think she's trying to say we both have our issues because we're both uh, being put in our own box by the other gender to a degree. Is that how you read it? Yes and no. Um, the issue, again, I take with it is when they have to spell it out so much. And because they do, when you get to the ending, you kind of say, well, wait, is this a fair ending? Well, yeah, isn't that the point? But OK, you're trying to be a very emotional movie, a very heartfelt movie as well. Should it end this way? Is this a fair way? And again, if it didn't spell out everything. And it just kind of kept with the characters and the comedy. I'd be totally okay with that. But because they do spell out everything else, I do feel like the message gets a little lost in there. And not entirely, because again, even though there's a lot of speeches, I'm not even going to say they're bad speeches. It's just something where I feel like, like you were seeing with Oppenheimer, you can bring what you bring to the movie. This is very much trying to shove in your face what you are supposed to take away. And when you do that too much, ironically, I think the message can get lost. 
Sure. Um, one good thing before I get to my jaw dropping moment that I'm excited about. I read an article that they're expecting Barbie to make over a hundred million dollars opening weekend. It is going to be big. And it's a weird movie. It's a strange movie. And for our jawheads listening to this, they're listening to a movie podcast. They're used to seeing all kinds of independent films yeah. and stranger films. But I love that this is as weird and strange as it is to be a blockbuster opening at over a hundred million dollars. I, I hats off to Gerwig there. Here's here's what I love. Uh and, and and this isn't mine. I saw this on YouTube, but but I think it's so apropos that Barbenheimer is is the movie event of the summer. In the summer, where we had uh, a new Indiana Jones movie come out, a new Mission Impossible movie come out, and these two movies are are like really the 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 biggest thing. It's awesome. It really is. Well. When, when's the last time you heard somebody going to see a double feature? Mm-hmm. Not only is somebody going to see a double feature, but tons yeah. of people are going to see a double feature. I haven't heard of that in years, and people are excited to go see it. One of them's three hours long. Barbie movies, two hours. That's five hours, not including the ads and the commercials and the trailers, just in the theater. I mean, that is something I haven't seen since, like, the black and white days of movies. Uh, so I, right. I think that's really, that is very, very impressive. That is very, very cool. It is. Um, jaw-dropping moment, favorite m- moment of the movie uh, that we might not have touched on. For me, uh, Doug, and maybe this is yours also, is the uh, beach fight between all the Kens um, that plays out almost like something out of, like, Saving Private Ryan. Um, I'll see you on the beach is even said at one point, but we're talking about throwing beach toys and umbrellas and footballs at the, each other of the different Kens that, that got a huge laugh out of me. And that, again, I checked out by that point. I said, I'm done with this subplot, <laughs> which I, again, I think is very good that we're going back and forth with this because it's showing, I think there is an audience definitely there that's going to enjoy all that. I definitely don't want to take the enjoyment away from people. It, and mine is the, again, the exact opposite. I love this scene where Barbie sits down on a bench and she hasn't been in the real world. She's experiencing fear, sadness, insecurity for the first time. And she sits down on the bench and she just accepts sadness, feels sadness. And she looks around, she sees a lot of sad people. And then she sees a couple laughing and she's like, okay, well, that's okay. And she turns to her right and she sees this old lady there and she accepts kind of her mortality. If she even has mortality, I don't even think she's even thought the concept of mortality. And she smiles, and the old lady smiles back. And I won't ruin the line mm. that they say to one another, but it's a wonderful line. Yeah. And it, to me, that's the heart of the movie. That's where I'm really like, man, there was something special here. I wish was in more of it, but again, I think there might be enough for people to really get into it and take a lot away from it. My movie poster quote was, Barbie is more than pretty in pink. She's smart, funny, and weird. Nice. How many jaws are you giving this thing? So Brian? I went three and a half jaws. We're on a four jaw scale here, Doug. Three and a half. Three and a half jaws for Barbie. How about you? Uh, I'm two and a half. I'm almost recommending it. I do think there's people that are going to get into it. I think there's too many flaws for me to say it works as a whole and it gets across everything it wants to do. But I think there is enough people out there that are going to overlook those problems and just enjoy uh, what's in front of them. Definitely. Uh, Barbenheimer, the win here is the moviegoers. I mean, I, two great movies. I mean, Doug might not be as high on Barbie, but at least it wasn't a dud. And no, no. And th- there's great things in it. I'm definitely sure. not going to act like there aren't great things. Yeah. In it. So I think the winner here is, is the moviegoers that are going to yeah. see two great movies mm-hmm. in, in a weekend. So Double feature. Yes. All right. Let's end this thing with some trivia. What do we say right. here? In honor of Barbie, we're playing Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling movie trivia. Doug, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals uh, if somebody gets hung up on their question. So, uh, I guess I'll go first. Let's get it over with. <laughs> All right. Question one over to Doug. Margot Robbie starred in one Quentin Tarantino film. What was it? Oh, that's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That is correct. Don't worry about me, Doug. I suck at this. I've been doing it for 15 years now, and I still I suck. Go on. It helps that might be my favorite Tarantino movie. That's why I remember that. <laughs> Matt, how many times has Margot Robbie appeared as Harley Quinn in film? Okay, uh, she is in. She's in. Um, she's in none of the Nolan movies. She was in Birds of Prey. And the Emancipation of Harley Quinn. She's in the first Suicide Squad 
and the second suicides or just suicide squad i'm going with three that is correct okay three tied up at one those were supposed to be the softballs okay good yeah <laughs> both on the board question three back over to doug ryan gosling who plays ken in uh barbie played officer k in this 2017 sci-fi noir uh blade runner it's got a longer title than just blade runner 2048 we're going to give it to him. It's actually okay. 2049. You were within okay. one. <laughs> we're giving that one to Yeah, Doug. I give it to I'm, him. I'm no good at math. <laughs> <laughs> Two to one, Doug. Question four over to Matt K. Besides her cameo in The Big Short, Margot Robbie starred in one movie with Christian Bale. It was reviewed here on Cinema John. Name the movie. Margot Robbie, Christian Bale in what? Hmm. I don't think she was in The Machinist. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure she wasn't in American Psycho. The Machinist. Uh, geez. Um, newsies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely incorrect. But Christian Bale was in that movie. Doug, you got a chance for a steal. Any guess on Christian Bale, Margot Robbie? This is only a guess. Is it Cheney? Incorrect. We're looking for Amsterdam. Came out like uh, last year. Amsterdam. Oh, oh yeah, that's duh. right. I yeah. forgot the movie even existed. Well, okay. she she has her hair dyed a dark color in that film, so I I, I forgot it was that's her. The Clark Kent glasses to it's, us. We we can't factor that. In. Totally. <laughs> it's still two to one, Doug. Question five is over to him. Ryan Gosling played an astronaut in one movie. Name it. Oh, oh I, I know the film. I'm trying to remember the title. Uh. Uh, first man? That is correct. Okay, wow. good. <laughs> I'm like, I know this movie, I just couldn't remember the title. <laughs> Three to one, Doug Walker. Question six over to Matt Kay. Matt, Ryan Gosling starred in one film directed by the Russo brothers. Name the movie. Okay. I'm leaning forward like I know the answer. I have no idea. I'm going to just take a stab in the dark here. I'm thinking of weird Ryan Gosling movies. The Place Beyond the Pines. That is incorrect. Doug, a chance for it to steal and blow this thing wide open. Uh, Avengers Endgame. Uh. I have no idea. <laughs> this is why we say the Netflix movies aren't memorable. They're not making the, the mark on oh, our memories. Oh, The Gray Man. The Gray Man. That Came was actually just good. last year, reviewed on the show. You don't even remember it. I liked it, though. I thought it was pretty good for a netflix action movie the score remains three to one doug he can win it right here on question seven doug this question's over to you in 2018 margot robbie starred as queen elizabeth the first which actress starred alongside her as mary in the movie mary queen of scots oh wait no i don't know this movie uh <laughs> mary I'll queen just of say, scots i'll just say when i don't know the answer i'll just say the British woman that's probably in the most of Helena Bomb Carter. <laughs> Incorrect. Matt, you got a okay. chance for a steal that's here. Yes. Well, I, I'm pretty sure it's not Olivia Coleman, right? So I, I would I would say is it there are they contemporaries in the movie? Um I well one one of them plays Queen Elizabeth the First, the other one plays Mary Queen of Scots. Yeah, so. I, I don't know my my ancient British history. So I'm gonna go with uh Sorcerer Ronan. Total guess. <laughs> Really? That is right. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <Sir Ronan. laughs> wow. That's it a, really? It that's really a, is. That's the first time that's ever paid off. I, I had wow. to take my thumb off the buzzer because I, I was 100% <laughs> sure you were getting that wrong. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> wow. We got a ball game well all of a sudden. Yeah. Holy crap. All right. It is three to two. And the last question's over to you, Matt. Margot Robbie starred in one movie with Charlize Theron and Nicole Kidman. Name the film. Margot Robbie, Charlize Theron, Nicole Kidman. Really? In what? This has happened? This has happened. Those are three powerful, wonderfully talented actresses in Hollywood. And I cannot put them in one movie together. Nicole Kidman. Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron. And Margot Robbie. Wow. That's like, how could I not remember this? I'm just going to say Birds of Prey because oh. I got nothing. 
Dr. Chase came back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Doug Walker wins this one, but do you have a guess, Doug? You know, I think I know the movie. I don't know the title. I think is it the Fox News movie? It is the Fox News oh, movie. Bombshell. I don't remember the title. That's bombshell. it should just be called that, that the that's Fox a News win, that's movie. a that's a win for Doug Walker right there. Yes. <laughs> Four to two. Can we get a virtual handshake yes. here, guys? Virtual fist bump. <laughs> there we go. Boom. <laughs> nice. If it came down to a tie, we call it a jawbreaker. It was this. Age of Margot Robbie, closest to. Doug, you got to guess how old's Margot Robbie? How old? Yeah. Uh, huh. I'll say 35. Lock him in at 35. Matt, you got to guess? I, I mean, I would have said, unlike Barbie, she's actually immortal. But mm-hmm. if I have to pick a year, 35, you're saying? It's probably a pretty sweet guess. I, I, she might be a little older than that. So, but not by much. I'll go thirty-six, and Give I never it to Doug did that. Walker thirty-three for Margot Robbie. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. I mean, she looks great. She, she looks great. <laughs> she looks Absolutely. Phenomenal. And, and she's got so many movies. When I was looking at, I mean, she's been around now for a lot longer than we think. You know. Yeah. Yeah, she, and, and man, she's operating like a top caliber. Oh, top. I agree. She's producing these movies. She's she acting produced in them. Barbie, yeah. yeah. She's she's at the top of her game. Real powerhouse. Good for her. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree. I it's I don't know. She brings a great energy to whatever project she touches. And I love that. I love anyone that it, it not just a great energy, but like a unique energy that i really love right Definitely. even like the first suicide squad movie which was a total piece of crap she's amazing in it you know like the yeah, scene a- she's everybody in. liked harley quinn in there yeah right. everyone's like oh it's a lot of problem but you know but she's great as harley nobody has you know any debate about that no doubt yes Unfortunately, we came to the end of a, a very fun, and entertaining podcast. But yeah. we got we got to close the curtain. We do. I could keep going, but we got to we got to oh. say good night. Yes. First and foremost, we got to thank our guest, Doug Walker. Thanks for coming back on Cinema Jaw. Thank you. Yeah. Anytime, man. This is always a lot of fun. Totally. Uh, we also got to thank our engineer, our editor, Phil Me and Phil. Thank you both so much. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else on a Thursday night. Yeah, why would you? Also, Matt, thanks to the Patreons who support the show. If you want to join us over there, very simple to do so. Go over to patreon.com slash cinemajaw. It would mean the world to us uh, for the Patreons already there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the other way to support the show, how do we do it, Matt? Just just hit subscribe. You know what? Wherever you are, hit subscribe or leave a review. Both help tremendously. doesn't matter if it's YouTube, iTunes, whatever the heck you're listening to it do it there thank you absolutely until next week i'm ryan the movie guy i'm matt k and keep on john about the movies, movies.